You know, Howard, before I start my 15-minute speech, I wanted to say that um, listening to you talk about Marie, it occurs to me that Marie abided and was motivated by the highest calling of a foreign correspondent, which is to bear witness. And to bear witness, you have to be where the danger is and where the news is happening. And there's no question in my mind that Rukmini very much abides the same model. Rukmini is all about bearing witness. Um, but in a real bit of role reversal, <clears throat> as you pointed out, I'm her editor, I'm going to use her words to begin to introduce her. <clears throat> I can't think of a better way than to quote from a story she wrote about her own personal journey. So this is, in, this is Rukmini, okay? More than three decades ago, my mother, grandmother, and I boarded a train in communist Romania, armed with papers my mother had painstakingly gathered in an effort to give me a better life. I was five years old, and I had been told we were going on vacation on holiday to Paris. The night before our departure, I lined up my stuffed animals and interviewed them to find out which ones wanted to come. Already, it's time she was a budding journalist. I decided they all wanted to come, and I put them all in my, my back. We reached Germany, where authorities provided us temporary housing. A week later, we took the train to Switzerland, where we were awarded uh, political refugee status. I'm skipping over a little bit, but the takeaway from this for her is, <clears throat> I'm deeply grateful to the officials in Germany and Switzerland who gave us safe passage. I'm even more grateful to the man at the immigration counter in the United States who stamped my form awarding me American citizenship. Look, many, I say this with great affection and sincerity. We're all grateful that you and your family made that brave and terrifying journey. You've given back so much through your journalism, bearing witness, giving voice to victims of the powerful, holding governments accountable, and always, always with empathy. You're a role model, and an inspiration, if sometimes difficult to manage. That was a jerk. <laughs> so here's her official bio. Rukmini is a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, the winner of the Michael Kelly Award, and the first journalist in the 75-year history of the Overseas Press Club to win two major awards in the same year. Sorry. She joined the Times in 2014, her series of articles underwriting Jihad, showing how ransoms paid by European governments had become one of the main sources of financing for Al-Qaeda, won her the George Polk Award for reporting. Before the Times, Rukmini spent 10 years at the Associated Press working with my friend and colleague, John Danishevsky, her ex-husband. Um, from 2006 to 2014, she was based in Dakar, Senegal, covering 20 countries as the correspondent and the West Africa Bureau Chief for the Associated Press. I'm going to um, improvise here for a second because I just want to add one other point about Rukmini. There are many times where Rukmini found herself among a horde of reporters, descending on big stories, whether it was uh, <clears throat> um, writing about sex victims of ISIS or Al Qaeda invading Mali. And without exception, she comes away with remarkable stories that no one else was able to find. I'd like to introduce you to Rukmini. Thank you so much, Michael. I need to be especially on my toes tonight because I have not only my current boss in the audience, but also my former boss who knew me before I even met my own husband. <laughs> I'm humbled and honored to receive this award in the name of the great Marie Colvin. I thank the university, the School of Journalism, its students, and I especially thank her family, her mother Rosemary, who's here with us tonight, her sister Kat, her brother Billy, her beloved nieces and nephews, Justine, Chris, Liam, Jennifer, and Michelle. Thank you. Perhaps more than any other reporter, Marie Colvin stood for the act of bearing witness. 
I wanted to take you back to one of the times in my own life when I believe I was able to bear witness myself. It was in 2011 in West Africa, in the country of Ivory Coast. I was a correspondent then for the Associated Press, and for the past six months, I had been chronicling how that country, once one of the most affluent in Africa, had spiraled into civil war. It was the last week of May, 2011. I was driving on the road between the towns of Yamasukro, which is right here, if I can point to it, in the middle of the country. Sorry, I don't think this buzzer is working. And uh, Tulipla, which is on the far left at the Liberia border. And then we stopped for gas. My driver came running back to the car and said that villagers were claiming that there had been a massacre deep in the country's uh, jungle at the river that separates Liberia from Ivory Coast. He claimed that government soldiers had overrun a refugee camp um, in, in this small place and had carried out a killing. We set out to meet one of the survivors who had managed to hike out of the jungle. He said the shooting had started at dinner time on the night of May 22, 2011. It was inside a small refugee camp located a mile and a half from the river. He said pe people had kicked over pots and dropped their plates of food as they tried to save themselves. The soldiers chased them down the trail, firing with automatic weapons, including a gun that had been mounted on top of a, of a wheelbarrow. He claimed that when they reached the water, dozens of people had thrown themselves to their death in the river, unable to swim, drowning, or being swept away. I was presented with the dilemma that journalists frequently face when they are documented human rights abuses in an inaccessible war zone. The young man's testimony was compelling, but I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, and so I could not be sure of the facts. Was he exaggerating? Was the death toll uh, too large? The young survivor then claimed that the bodies of the dead were still on the jungle floor. And so I asked him, would you be willing to take me there? He looked at me with trepidation and said that he could take me and AP photographer Rebecca Blackwell to the banks of the river. He said it would be three hours by motorcycle. At the river, I would only be a mile and a half from the massacre site, but he warned me that he himself could not go any further than the Liberian side of the river because he feared the killers were still at large in the forest. So at the crack of dawn the next morning, we took off on the backs of motorcycles and sped across a dirt highway, which turned into a narrow trail. Hours later, we got to the river. Here it is. We stood on its western edge inside Liberia. And as Rebecca and I were discussing what to do next, by the way, these are her images, people began coming out of the bushes, a few at first, and then close to a dozen. They had all survived the massacre, and some of them had lost relatives. Others didn't know what had happened to their loved ones. The site of the massacre, they repeated to us, was exactly one and a half miles uphill from the opposite bank of the river where I was standing. I'm a runner and I know that I can run three miles, so double that distance, in around 25 to 26 minutes. Now, I would be walking half the distance, I'd be walking it uphill with my gear on my back, but I thought it shouldn't take longer than, than about that time. The problem was we didn't know if the killers were still at large. At the same time, the massacre had happened several days prior, and the survivors told us that they had not heard gunfire since that night, suggesting that the killers had retreated. Rebecca and I were presented with the kind of security conundrum that you too will face if you ever choose to cover conflict. Should we go? Was the story worth it? By this point, a small group of relatives of the victims were standing by the river's edge, and when they saw us hesitating, one by one, they said they would accompany us. So we decided to take it step by step. Step one was that we would use this canoe that you see here, it's made from a, from a log, to cross the river. The survivors told us that just on the other side of the river, not even a few dozen yards up the trail, we would find the first set of bodies. So we decided to cross. We got safely to the other side. Now I want you to picture what this looks like. We are more than three hours by motorcycle from the nearest town. There's no cell phone network. It was very clear to us that we were fully on our own, should anything go wrong. But by that point, 
everything the, witness, the witnesses and the survivors had told us was panning out. We walked a few dozen yards up the trail. The undergrowth was closing in around us, and we immediately began to see the signs of the massive exodus that had happened here. People's belongings were strewn all over the trail. I found plates of half-eaten food, birth certificates, ID cards, driver's licenses, and items that clearly indicated women and children had been here, like a baby's bib and a baby's bottle, a bra that was snagged between two branches, and one woman's hair extensions, which I think you can see here wedged in the mud. This was important because the government of Ivory Coast would later try to claim that the victims were not civilians, rather that they were rebels, dangerous militiamen, armed, violent. The evidence on the ground said otherwise. The next slide that I'm going to show is somewhat graphic. We hiked a little further, and we reached the first of the bodies. The survivors who were with us identified this woman as a lady who ran a mobile market stall in the jungle. She was trying to run when, when they cut her down. At this point, we were maybe a fifth of the way up the trail. Emboldened, we decided to keep walking, and then we entered the forest proper. We were so frightened of running into the soldiers that we walked in total silence. I remember thinking that just the sound of my breath was too loud. How could I breathe more quietly? I kept looking over my shoulder, and I worried about Rebecca, who was ahead of me, taking pictures at the front of the line of roughly a dozen people who were now snaking their way up the jagged trail. It was probably no more than 20 minutes, but it felt like hours before we made it to the top of the clearing. We entered the camp, and we saw that the attackers had set fire to the dwellings. And at first, I couldn't see the bodies, but we smelled them all around us. One of the survivors made a sound like a muffled cry when he saw this wheelchair. He recognized it as the wheelchair belonging to a woman named Amelie Vlanhu. She was a middle-aged woman who was handicapped. Her son looked after her. Days later, I would track down and interview her son, who would describe to me what happened that night. He says that when the shooting erupted, he tried to push his mother toward the trail, but he panicked when the wheelchair got stuck on the uneven ground. He ducked and ran, leaving his own mother. She lowered herself onto the forest floor and tried to drag herself into the vegetation, but she couldn't pull in her paralyzed legs. They stuck out of the foliage. The soldiers spotted her, dragged her back as she sobbed and tried to hold onto the dirt. We found her body not far from her wheelchair. You know, I had heard the term raped and killed more times than I can count before I set foot in this clearing. Raped and killed, raped and killed. I had read it in a book chronicling the awful wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone. I had heard it in documentaries about what had happened in the former Yugoslavia. And practically every month, I received at least one press release from Human Rights Watch using that phrase to describe what was then happening in lawless Eastern Congo. Raped and killed, raped and killed. And while I had heard steps, including the physical description of a white-colored bus, even though they were abducted on different days and in villages that were miles apart, what was clear to me at the end of my first assignment in Iraq is that this wasn't something that had happened by accident. This was a well-meditated and carefully orchestrated, orchestrated plan to kidnap women and girls for the purpose of raping them. F says that the bus drove her and the other girls to the city of Mosul in Iraq, where they were first placed in something called the Galaxy Wedding Hall. Inside the vast wedding hall were at least 1,500 other women. It was one of around a dozen locations in Iraq um, that acted as essentially human holding pens for the girls. In each location, F and the other girls described a similar set of procedures. Early on, a group of ISIS officials showed up with a ledger. They went woman by woman and girl by girl, asking them to state their name, their age, their hometown, whether or not they were married, and if so, the names of any children. Next, they separated the unmarried girls from the married ones. The unmarried ones, who were assumed to be virgins, were considered the most valuable. They were taken away first. The girls described how the same set of white buses uh, came and they transported them to the next location, where prospective buyers came and chose the girls that they wanted for themselves. Young girls told me how they knew that their beauty was a liability. 
One blue-eyed girl, who could have passed for a model if she lived in New York, explained to me how her older sister took mud and used it to smear dirt on her face to try to make herself look ugly in the hopes that she wouldn't be picked. Others told me how they would refuse to bathe and let their hair get matted or fail to brush their teeth so that they could be as unattractive as possible. F, who was only 14 when she was taken and is stunningly beautiful, was among, among the first to be chosen. She told me that she was driven with about two dozen other, other teenage girls to a military base. It was there as she was getting out that she first heard the word sabaya for the first time. The word means slave. And sometime later, the emir of the group holding her came to explain to the girls that because they are Yazidi and practice a religion other than Islam, that according to his reading of the Quran, ISIS had the right to enslave them. Last year, the research, the so-called research and fatwa department of the Islamic State released the first of several brochures on slavery. This one was released in uh, October and November uh, of 2014. It acts as a kind of questions and answers on slavery for the fighters. It lays out that a woman who is not Muslim and who is captured in war is eligible to be enslaved. Once her eligibility for enslavement is determined, there's almost no boundaries to when and where she can be raped. According to this brochure, even child rape is per permissible. See here question number 13. Is it permissible to have sex with a female slave who has not yet reached puberty? Answer. It is permissible to have sex with the female slave who hasn't reached puberty if she is fit for intercourse. The brochure is just one of several publications that the Islamic State put out, making crystal clear what they were doing. No denial here. Does the Quran actually sanction save slavery? What scholars of Islam have explained to me is that, yes, it does. But it appears in the Quran, as well as in the larger canon of Islamic jurisprudence, much of slavery appears in the Bible namely as a reflection of the time in antiquity when the Quran was written. That period of time was a time in the ancient world when slavery was widely practiced. ISIS is now attempting to create a world in the image of the one they believe the Prophet Muhammad lived in. So they argue that slavery must be reinstituted. While it is true that slavery did exist in the time of the Prophet, just as it is true that it existed in the time of Jesus, ISIS has taken it several steps further. They argue that because slavery is mentioned in the Quran, it is therefore not just permissible, but virtuous. In addition to the word sabaya, meaning slave, the young women told me that they began to learn to hear another word, ibada. Ibada means worship, and this is the world the girls hurt when they protested the rape. The fight fighter would tell them, raping you is ibada, meaning raping you is a form of worship. Just about the most disturbing detail that I learned in reporting the story is that before and after each rape, many of the girls I spoke to said that the fighter would kneel down on the floor next to the bed and pray, essentially bookending the rape with an act of religious devotion. I wanted to end uh, this presentation with the story of this little girl. I'll call her G, after the initial of her first name. She is now 13, and she was 12 when she was kidnapped and eventually bought by a Libyan fighter in Syria. She said that on the day when he first raped her he, took her, he took her inside his bedroom and bound her hands and gagged her so that she couldn't scream. Then he knelt beside the bed and prostrated himself in prayer before getting on top of her. When it was over, he went and took a shower, and then he prayed again. I kept telling him it hurts. Please stop, she told me. He told me that according to Islam, he is allowed to rape an unbeliever. He said that by, he said that by raping me, he is drawing closer. To God. A total of 5,270 Yazidi people were abducted on Mount Sinjar in 2014 as they were trying to flee. More than 3,000, a majority of them women and girls, remain in captivity today. I pray that by bearing witness to their suffering, that suffering may one day end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you. Let's start by talking about ISIS. What is your sense of the strength of ISIS now? 
Is it continuing to grow? Do you think there's any chance that the forces allied against it can contain it? Uh, the latest figures that we saw for the recruitment of foreign fighters showed that at least through late 2015, they were continuing to aggressively recruit and successfully recruit foreign fighters from Europe, especially from France, from Britain. At the same time, uh, their territory is now under siege, especially in Iraq and Syria. And as that territory shrinks, and as their so-called caliphate is, uh, is, is pulled back, we're expecting that that is going to, to dent the group. By, but by how much, we don't know. So you think that um, the force that the, the bombing campaign, the aerial campaign, is going to be effective in curtailing their territory? Do you think it will, that, that the effort to create this caliphate will morph in some way into some new form? Do you have any thoughts on what might be next? Number one, what we have seen is that, is that this group, and, and Al-Qaeda before it, has metastasized. So you're no longer talking about just Iraq and Syria. You're now talking about Libya. You're talking about Yemen. You're talking about the Sinai. You're talking about Bangladesh now. Uh, you're talking about corners of Asia, Afghanistan. They have so-called provinces in all of these places. So, so the question for an intervention is, if you push on Iraq and Syria, OK, maybe you can take back Raqqa and Mosul. But then are you going to also commit troops in, in, these, other, in these other theaters? What I have seen is in every single place where aggressive military might was put up against these groups, and I saw it in Mali, I've seen it recently in Sinjar, uh, and in Hasaka in northern Syria, when you have aggressive aerial bombardment and you have a group like the Kurds or like French forces like we saw in Mali who were on the ground, the group folds very quickly. In Mali, I saw they had taken the northern half of the country, which is an area the size of Afghanistan, and they, they held it for almost a year. And in three weeks, the French were able to push them back. In three weeks. And in Sinjar, it was a matter of days. Uh, on, the, on the radios, we could hear ISIS commanders saying, drop everything, retreat, burn every base, get out of here. Um, and so when the military might is there, it, it's really like pushing on an open door. But the problem is you then have to stay there. Uh, the French have now essentially re re retreated from Mali, and in the, the period that they've retreated, we have seen some of the biggest ter terrorist attacks that they have ever created. Um, in, just recently, we had the massive attack on the Splendid Hotel in Burkina Faso. Late last year, we had the Radisson Hotel in Bamako. They, they had never been to Bamako before. That was further south than they ever were before. So the question is, if, if you are for a military intervention, are you also for forces staying in these places, and not just in one, in multiple places. So I think we're, we're facing a, a very difficult challenge on that front. Can you talk a little bit about the relations between ISIS and Al-Qaeda? Uh, very strained. <laughs> um, I, um, uh, I'm talking to one guy in, um, in Al-Qaeda now, uh, and there's a, there seems to be a generational divide. So the Al-Qaeda guys are older. They tend to also be much more educated. Um, the, the man I'm talking to has gone to college. Um, he speaks perfect English, and he won't tell me where he's gone to school, but I'm pretty sure he's American. Uh, by contrast, the ISIS people that I've spoken to are, are practically teenagers. You know, they're, and they're at that level of, of immaturity. Um, but they're, they're very much at loggerheads now. I don't think that there's any rapprochement that is possible between the two groups. Um, and sadly, because of this competition, we have now seen a group that is even more radical you know, than, than Al-Qaeda. ISIS is even more brutal than Al-Qaeda, which is hard to believe. What's happening now in Bangladesh that you referred to just now? Uh, ISIS has uh, aggressively been courting um, Bangladesh. And in the past, I would say, year, there have been at least a half dozen targeted assassinations, mostly of journalists, of, of editors of secular newspapers, um, columnists that spoke out against extremism. and. Um, you know, so they, their presence seems to be seems to be growing there. This is uh, I've read about bloggers in Bangladesh. Is that what you're exactly? About? Yeah. Exactly. So this is an organized Al -Qa Al Qaeda or ISIS? Well, ISIS is claiming responsibility for it. Of course, we don't really know, but it's only ISIS that's claiming responsibility for it. Al Qaeda is not claiming it. No other group is claiming it. So mm -hmm. it leads you to believe that it that it would be them. Uh, and in Yemen. That's another situation with its own set of roots and causes, but ISIS is involved there, Al-Qaeda is involved there. Yemen has for years been, uh, been the home of Al-Qaeda's strongest affiliate, AQAP. In fact, the general manager of Al-Qaeda 
was the head of AQAP. And that's um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And so it's it's surprising that ISIS would, would get a toehold there, but they have. And um, they're, you know, they, they have an organized effort there. I don't know how many fighters, but, but they're fighting with Al-Qaeda and they're fighting with security forces there. Now, in your work, you found that um, when you found this giant trove of Al-Qaeda papers in um, Timbuktu, yes. and you discovered that Al-Qaeda is run very much like a corporation um, with uh, expense accounts and receipts and workshops and uh, uh, some kind of a hierarchy uh, and accountants. <laughs> um, is ISIS similarly run? Very much so. Uh, I mean, I just tweeted, I think this morning before I came to, to this presentation, um, they just announced uh, that they're upping the traffic police um, in Raqqa and have, have given out 120 tickets for parking violations. So these are, these are groups that are, tr that are trying to mimic um, the runnings of a state uh, that, that are quite hierarchical and that are by nature very bureaucratic. Uh, they are groups that have limited resources and so it makes sense that they would want to they would want to track, you know, their spending. I think a question for a lot of us observing this uh, this on the one hand the effort to retreat to a kind of medieval approach to life, it seems very selective. AK forty sevens were not around in the eighth, seventh, and eighth centuries. Exactly. So exactly. The, how did, they, how did the, your sources deal with that conflict? That that paradox. Um, the people that I find the most interesting on this topic are former extremists who were either with Al-Qaeda or with ISIS and who have managed to pull themselves back. Uh, one of them is a Canadian uh, who went to join the Taliban um, more than a decade ago and somehow just found his way back. And I've seen him on Twitter and I've seen him argue with these people and that's exactly the point he makes, which is that the Quran talks about riding into battle on your steed, you know, on your horse. He said, where's your horse? You know, where, I mean, if you're, if you're going to put a literal interpretation on the, on the verses that talk about beheading, where's your horse? You know, why are you going in, yeah. in a fleet of SUVs? Uh, they're not too open <laughs> to this suggestion. Interesting. Um, you've also written about the domestic side of a terrorist recruitment. Um, <clears throat> America and Europe, because they know that those places of worship in general are, are liberal, um, uh, welcoming, and non-radical places. She might be able to fill the emptiness in her life with actual friendships in right. the real world as opposed to the right. virtual world. Right. Should she go if, if her grandmother had been privy to what was going on, the warning sign should have been the moment when they when they Googled the, the, the mosque in the tri-city uh, tri area in Washington and realized that the mosque had put uh, an announcement on its website denouncing ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and they told her, this is a government-run mosque, it's run by the FBI, you shouldn't go there. And it was at that moment when what, they brought her inwards. You know, they, said that, they said that she should only essentially speak to them and have, have access to their version of the religion, and that was the moment when I think she went into, into a spiral. Do you think that there's anything that we can do as a, a society or a culture I suppose it's just to be more attentive and better parents, friends. I don't know. Is there any kind of social change that you think is possible to forestall these conversions to violence? Right. Well, I think I think one of the really unfortunate things that's happening is the backlash against regular, moderate Muslims. And every single time that happens, you can't, I, you know, I can't actually prove this, but I suspect that there are some that are in that moderate fold that suddenly go, well, to heck with this. You know, if I can't, if I can't wear my hijab and I can't pray and I can't fast during Ramadan, then I don't have a place in the society. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I do agree with the administration when they say that, that the Muslim community is our ally. They are the ones who are most likely to see um, these kind of deviations happening. And the demonization that is happening now uh, in part through you know the, the the political process and the debates, is I think is I think quite dangerous. Thank you, Rukmini. I think we're ready to open up the uh, mics to questions from the audience. Please come to one of the microphones, and I'll I'll repeat the question so that people in the back can hear if necessary. Do you think the major? Oh, um, I'm Chris Colvin. 
Rick Halvin, Snead, uh, Nephew. Um, do you think the major cause of radical Islamic terrorism is the fundament, the extremist view of the religion itself, or like a uh, need for power when they're put in such a traumatic or unstable situation since birth? The reasoning behind the, the radicalization. Cause. Okay. Is it the fundamentalist view of the religion itself, or the need for power or something else because of their unstable or chaotic upbringing? Mm -hmm. I think so. Whether it's okay, I think the ideology is very much to blame, and I, I think we 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 keep on trying to look for other explanations. Oh, you know this 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 country's in chaos, and therefore they went this way, or. Um, I remember during the Paris attacks, a lot of effort was spent into trying to, fi try to figure out wh whether the suicide bombers that were at the various sites, whether, whether they were drugged. No evidence has come out that they were drugged, but that it's, it's as if we're reaching for something we can understand. Oh, if they're drugged, you know, maybe they can do this. And from speaking to these jihadists, I will tell you w without a doubt, they are Muslim, and they very much believe in, in this particular and, um, and flawed interpretation of Islam. Um, so I think that's what's driving it. That's my personal opinion. Very moving stories. And I remember when you wrote that article about the girl in Washington State. Uh, I remember reading that. Uh, anyway, so um, I have a question about the military side of things. It's very depressing story that we can take territory from ISIS, but then as soon as we move out, they come back stronger than ever. Yeah. So it seems like we need you know, local troops on the ground, but there aren't enough Kurds on the planet to, and I don't, is anyone else going to step up beside the Kurds? That's sort of the conundrum, you know, in, in all of these places, the, the local standing armies just don't have the capacity. You know, I, I, I remember when, when Northern Mali fell um, to the Islamists in the year tw uh, 2012, the soldiers who were there, many of them had been trained by the U.S. military. Some of them had even, had, even had, had elite training in America. And yet, as soon as the Islamists bore down on Timbuktu, etc., we were, we were taking copy from, from our stringers in the region who were saying that the soldiers were literally ripping their uniforms off their bodies and running in their underwear. That, that's how bad it was. Um, the Kurds are very, several notches above that, of course, but they still don't have, without, without the bombardments, the Kurds are no force against ISIS. Without the aerial support, they can't, they can't advance. And I saw that with my own eyes when I, was in, when I was in Hasaka in northern Syria last year, where you would literally see a direct relationship between the rate of the bombardment and the rate of advance on, on the ground. So the question becomes, what, what is the role that we want our country you know, to play? How, you know, and, and as soon as our young men start coming back in body bags, that question becomes quite poignant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm a journalism student I'm from China, and this is my sophomore year. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Chinese government, our President Jinping, she implemented a harsh ever censorship to the journalism. So I might go back to China after I graduated from here. So I'm wondering how could I pursue my journalism dream in a country like China? God, I think that's a question that I might not have a very good answer to. Um, perhaps Michael, the foreign editor <laughs> of the New York Times, has a, has a better answer. Um, I think that you need to bite off uh, stories that you can do. Uh, maybe don't start out you know, with, the, with the stories that are the most controversial. There's a lot of things that you can, that you can cover as a young reporter uh, in China um, and, and feel your way out from there that way. Hi there, Hi. I'm Sophia Rico, I'm a freshman journalism major, and um, I kind of want to do like what you did with the foreign correspondent going into like these very dangerous countries, but whenever I tell people that, they tell me, oh, it's dangerous, and then that fear gets into my mind. Like, what would your advice be for someone that wants to go in that, but like doesn't know how to face their fear about, you know, like the danger that will come with it? Number one, I would tell you that I think the world is much more dangerous now than it was even a couple years ago. Um, so I think that you need to think long and hard about where you're going to go. Uh, I mean, you, you know about James Foley and Stephen Sotloff and these journalists who have been beheaded. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you should be running off to these places. Um, there's a lot of very interesting reporting that you can do overseas. 
in West Africa, for example, and you know, there's there's some 20 countries in West Africa that are getting very little coverage, uh, and uh, those are places where if, if I was to rewind my life, I would not have gone to India. There, India has an abundance of, of very talented English-speaking reporters. Africa does not. Um, so you can go to those areas, and I would start by doing that, um, and doing I, and doing stories. You know, lifestyle stories, stories about uh, about the economic situation there, before you ever venture into a conflict zone. Okay, thank you. Sure. And I might add, from your own experience in West Africa, that writing about famine and malnutrition sure. and and the changing the changing climate in Africa is some great reporting to Absolutely. be done. Very, very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have more of a policy uh, question. Uh, do you think the Obama administration has done enough to intervene in Syria? How do you deal with these women? How do you react to them? How do you, like, what do you tell these young girls and these women that have been through these horrors mm -hmm. to make them feel safe again? Um, you know, I, I actually do the opposite. You know, when I'm, when I'm interviewing these girls, I'm, I'm very blunt and honest about, first of all, the limits of what my story is able to do. Uh, and, and I came to this kind of late. You know, I used to sort of glide over it and, and tell them that, well, hopefully somebody's going to read the story and, um, and maybe there's, you know, somebody is going to react and maybe something's going to happen. I, I've decided that that's completely the wrong approach. What I tell them is, I am here to tell your story. I have no guarantee. There is no guarantee I can give you that telling the story will change anything. But at least we're trying. At least we're trying to get this out in the public, in the public eye. And when I'm when I'm honest like that with them, they usually they usually are thankful, you know, and say, first of all, in, in Iraq, I had several women who had been interviewed by other journalists tell me, thank you so much. That's what I suspected. But we've had journalists here from all over the world who tell us that we're going to get refugee status, who tell us that we're going to get money, who I don't know who these people are, um, and that they could make, you know, such such unethical promises. But by doing the opposite, you know, and by, by, by essentially setting them up for the worst case scenario, I feel that they then feel that I'm being honest with them, and, and that makes them open up more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Colin. Um, when you were working for the Associated Press in West Africa, you referenced the apathy factor in, for famine. Do you see anything similar happening with the atrocities committed by ISIS? And if so, how can that apathy be prevented? Mm. In Africa, I mean, we were fighting the apathy factor all the time. And the, I mean, the, the number one question I used to get whenever I was pitching any story was, why would anybody care? It got to the point after, <laughs> after some like, seven or eight years in Africa where that question started to really annoy me. You know, it was, you know, are we saying that we don't care about these people because what? Because they're from a poor country, because they're black? Why is it that, that we don't care? But what it did is it made me hone my skill. And I realized you can't, you can't just tell a story. You can't tell the story, for example, of famine. It's been told a million times. You have to find a more detailed, interesting, angled way in. Um, and yes, I think we are at the point, certainly with the Syrian war, where you know, these barrel bombs continue to fall and, 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 and the reaction is no. Um, and I think people have been dead into it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Michelle, and before I ask my question, I just want to say I've been following your work for the past year, and I had a major fangirl moment when I found out that you'd be here tonight. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, like, uh, my question is uh, about the story about Alex, the Sunday school teacher, and I remember reading it and thinking, how did you come across the story, and like, how long did you have to do your research, and how deep did you have to deep? to get into the bottom of the story, because mm. that was that's one of my favorite stories. Mm. That story was an unusual, an, an unusual path to it. I, um, there, there's a group of internet um, vigilantes, let's call them. Uh, some of them belong to the group Anonymous. Some of them are hackers. Some of them are just, you know, people in their, their mom's basement. But they've taken it upon themselves to try to fight ISIS online. They're trying to shut down ISIS accounts. They're, they're alerting the FBI whenever they see something that looks like suspicious activity on Facebook. And one of these people, um, who, who's a man whose real name I don't know, um, who I, I've never actually spoken to him on the phone. I've only ever interacted with him on social media. He had noticed Alex. He had noticed her posts. 
uh, and he had noticed, he, he suspected that she was very young, um, which, was, which was correct, and he noticed her spiral into, into more and more radical language. But he also noticed, he, he reached out to her, and he also noticed that she was open you know, to talking to other people. So he introduced me to her, um, and initially I was only talking to her on Twitter, and then very quickly she let me call her. Um, she told me her real name, and then in a, in a very touching moment she asked me, would you mind talking to my grandma? <laughs> um, so of course, you know, and so I had a long conversation with her grandmother, and her grandmother, I, I was afraid at the moment when the grandmother got involved that that would sort of end it, you know, that, that the parent would not want um, the story out there. In fact, her grandmother was so desperate at that time and so scared that Alex would actually try to go that she thought that if we did an article, you know, then it would, it would be out there, the FBI would know about her, um, and it would sort of, you know, scare her straight, right? Um, and so they invited us to their home, and I went. It was me, um, a photographer, and a videographer. We all went. And... Um, we spent about a week, you know, in, in Washington State, just spending time with her at her house, doing things that she does with her. And um, the photographer had already left. Uh, and if you'll remember the narrative, she was in touch with the man that we suspected was an ISIS recruiter. And then she cut it off. And then suddenly she sort of, she slipped. And she, um, she started contacting him again. I had packed my bag and I had checked out of my hotel. And her grandmother called me when I was on the highway, basically, basically leaving, saying, Rukmini, please come back. You know, I think there's something wrong here. So we drove straight back. Um, and in a strange way, we were, it, it's not that we were part of the intervention, but we were certainly witnesses to it. Um, and the, the family essentially wanted us there as some sort of, some sort of mechanism for keeping her honest. Um, and thankfully, I think she's pulled herself out. Um, she, the last, she keeps on text, texting me. She recently got close to straight A's um, at the college class where she, community college where she enrolled. Um, so hopefully she's, I think, turned the corner. Um, how effective do you think Twitter is to like actually do your research and get into contact with sources and kind of verify them? Mm -hmm. In the entire process. On the jihadi beat, it's absolutely essential. I don't think that you can cover terrorism today without Twitter. And it's Twitter. It's not Facebook. It's not, yes, they use all of these other, they use Tumblr, Facebook, whatever. But Twitter is really the, 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 the driving mechanism for, for their propaganda now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Two more questions. Christy? This isn't sticky, so I'm just going to grab it. First of all, I want to say that as a female journalist, I think it's really awesome to see you up here and hear your story Thanks. sitting next to one of the fiercest <laughs> journalism professors we have here. So I think that's great. But my question to you is, the first story you were talking about with the a disabled woman in the wheelchair, you, you said you were sitting there by the river and saying, do I need to bear witness? I, I need to do this to publish it. When you're dealing with stories of rape, which in unfortunately many cases it can be a he said, she said scenario. Right. right. Has there ever been a story that you heard that you weren't able to report because it was just a he versus she scenario? Oh, so many, so many. Uh, on that very trip, there were other things that we, that we heard that we just couldn't you know, put together. It was the position of their bodies and the, and the condition of their private, of what we saw that made very, very clear what had happened. Um, and, and on top of that, what, what I wasn't able to get into is there were several people that um, saved themselves by diving on, in the undergrowth very nearby. Um, so to what happened to Emily, there was a direct eyewitness, and to what happened to the other woman, there was a direct eyewitness. Um, so that combined allowed me to, to, I think, say without a shadow of a doubt that that was what, would hap what happened. So are you saying that when, when we would, as a, we would talk to somebody, do we need to find a direct eyewitness as to report it, or it's not what I'm saying? But um, but in a situation like like rape, where often um, where often you only have you know two people in the room, um, you need to do a lot more work. Just because otherwise, you know, if if the story is if the story devolves as we saw recently with Rolling Stone, really it's on you, right? Um, and so, in, in essence, what I tell my sources when I'm, when I'm really pushing them on this is it's to protect you. It's to protect the integrity of your account that I need to ask these questions and that I need to find other people that can at least, they might not be able to, you know, confirm the actual event, but they can. Formative experience, and that's one of the most important things the Calvin Center does. And next year, 
the Kabul Center will bring our first journalist in residence here to Stony Brook. A journalist who's working overseas will get the chance to get out of the line of fire and spend a semester here at the journalism school and to write and to teach and to share his or her experiences. Um, there are a lot of other things happening in the journalism school. You can find some information on the table on the way out. There'll be another speaker here on April 19th. How many of you have seen the movie Spotlight? Well, Michael Resendiz, the real Michael Resendiz in Spotlight, will be here to tell the story of how he broke the story of the pedophile priest. He'll be our next speaker. But most of all, I need you to join with me in not only thanking Rukmini, but wishing her Godspeed in whatever she does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.